This is the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is David and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Today's show is a deconversion not so anonymous episode. In these episodes, people like you who have gone through a faith transition can tell your story, either anonymously or in all your glory. It's up to you. If you would like to tell your faith transition story, anonymously or otherwise, get in touch with me at gracefulatheist at gmail.com or at gracefulatheist on Twitter. On today's episode, Matt Cook is on the show. Matt was a former evangelical missionary and preacher who lost his faith about six years ago. One of the great things about doing this podcast is getting to talk to people with a broad range of experiences. Matt is not your typical deconvert. Several years after deconversion, Matt chose to live a year Christianly. During that year, he prayed and read the Bible daily. He went to church and practiced other spiritual disciplines. Although it did not change his mind, he has found continued value in these disciplines and practices some of them to this day. In the exact opposite of the common phrasing, Matt considers himself religious, but not spiritual. Here are a couple quotes from his blog that try to explain this idea. I pray and read the Bible. I belt out hymns and attend church. Christianly myth undergirds my interpretation of reality. I love sacred things. I'm religious, and I can't help it. Another one from his blog. The benefit of being religious but not spiritual is that I can hack my religion. I can toss out every word of the law that contradicts the spirit of love, and with a nod to Marie Kondo, every doctrine that sparks no joy. You can learn more about Matt and his year of living Christianly at his blog, mwcook.com, and on his YouTube channel by searching Cook 82 Links will be in the show notes. And now I give you my conversation with Matt Cook. Hi, Matt, uh, and welcome to the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, really excited to hear your story. I think I think this is going to be uh, a good one. So yeah, yeah, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. So I, I call these uh, deconversion anonymous episodes, but really, you can be as anonymous or as as out uh, front as you want to be. Uh, so tell us just a little bit about yourself, as much or as little as you want to tell about, tell about yourself. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Um... You know, I was, uh, uh, you know, like a lot of people that you're talking to probably raised in a evangelical, I guess I could say a fundamentalist uh, uh, family. Um, actually, my father is the son of a convert. So he kind of inherited the, mm. um, the very rigorous uh, evangelical framework from that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh yeah, growing up, it was always, the, the church was one of the things that I was able to kind of understand. Uh, uh, I always felt kind of out of place at school and in all the other kind of the world, right? Right. But right. when it came to Sunday school and youth group and Bible camp, that's where I was kind of able to feel more comfortable. So, you know, yeah, I went to that... Bible college right after high school because I was like, I'm not going to university. That's <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's interesting. You, you know, you're, you're, what you're describing is that, you know, in the church world, you have a baked in community. You have a baked in group yes. of people who, who ostensibly care about you and express, yep. you know, they're, they're, they're glad to see you when you show up and they, yep. give you they a miss hug. you when you're gone. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's such a, the, the interesting thing about uh, evangelicalism is that it's such a small feeling community that you're mm-hmm. actually able to get stuff um, that's, that's more difficult, uh, uh, than just kind of being thrown into the wild and into the schools, you know? Right. Uh, so, so for someone like me who, uh, it, I find it very easy to get anxious around other people. So mm-hmm. the church was a very comforting place for me. Yeah. And, and I was kind of good at it too. You know, I was always getting, you know, the big chocolate bars in Sunday school. <laughs> I was pretty yeah. good at memorizing and stuff like that. Yeah, you got all the stars on the board. <laughs> all the stars, yeah. yeah. Got all the answers right. Yeah, all right. Did you did you do things like the Bible memorization uh, contests? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah. And sword drills. Man, I was good at those sword drills. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was actually funny. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I was trying to tell my kids what a sword drill was. You know, right. because because I, I kind of deconverted maybe about six years ago now. 
So they, they didn't get the, you know, rigorous religious education that I did growing up. Yeah. So it was, they were like, wait, what? Did yeah. You where everything in the Bible was? Yeah, any book, any verse I could find it, like, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so that's interesting. You've said it, I've, and I kind of stepped on you a little bit. I want you to tell me a little bit more. Uh, so it sounds like your family, uh, they were evangelical and, and kind of inherited that. Yep. About, about what age for yourself did you start to, you know, take that on as your own identity? Yeah. So, so like a lot of people, I was, you know, uh, uh, you know, born again uh, at a very young age, you know, mm -hmm. like I think I was four years old on the way home from Awana. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so clearly you can make deep life-changing decisions at four. Yes. Yes. I certainly <laughs> felt the weight, the burden of my sin and my need for a savior yes. at four. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I think that it really started to become important to me in high school, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because that's when also, you know, other people in the classes are starting to talk about these issues and stuff like that. And, and you know, I joined the, uh, what do you call it, the inter-school Christian fellowship. And okay. I just started to think, actually, actually, I remember, I went, I went through a very brief period in high school where I, I stopped believing. I thought this, this must be kind of made up because it seems oh, really outlandish, mm -hmm. a lot of these claims. And I, I, had, a, I had a friend at the time uh, who, who was an atheist and we'd have interesting discussions. But then I remember I went to a Bible camp that I hadn't been to before. I'd always gone to this one Bible camp up in Bancroft, but this, this year for some reason I went to a different one. Mm -hmm. and, and the speaker, uh, well, this is interesting. He, um, he was trying to do some apologetic stuff right? Because we're all right. senior youth. We're all like maybe 16 or 17 years old. So he starts talking about reasons why we can trust the Bible, mm -hmm. right? And, and one of them, one of those reasons, they just kind of grabbed me in a funny place. Right. And it just kind of, I was like, oh my God, I think this stuff's real. I think yeah. that all these things in the Bible are actually real life true. And if that's the case, then there's nothing else worthwhile than pursuing God. You know, yeah. like, if, if, if the claims of evangelicalism are actually real, then every other waste, uh, every other life is a waste. Right. You know, and, and then no, and also, you know, on the flip side, no matter what happens, so long as I'm pursuing Christ, it's worth everything. Even if, you know, from the world's point of view, I have a wasted life. Right. So that's, I think that's where it started. Uh, yeah. My kind of my reconversion after my first deconversion. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I always say that I'm a I'm still a fundamentalist about one issue, and and that mm. is the resurrection, right? Mm. If, the, if, the, if the resurrection literally happened, then we should all be Christians. We should all absolutely, be yeah, absolutely. If, yeah. if 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 that one thing is true, then uh, everything is lost compared yeah. to knowing him. That's right. Yeah. So a couple, two things I want to respond to. One is that you know it's interesting you mentioned apologetics being effective for you. Uh, as, as a, you know, a teenager, it seems like apologetics in many ways uh, are aimed not at the non-believer, but at the, at the, either the, the lukewarm believer or the believer who's, who's struggling a little bit. And really yep. it's, it's to push them uh, off the fence. Uh, yes. And that seems yes. And I think that's how it, that's how it affected me because of course, at the time I had only just started ex experimenting with doubt. <laughs> uh, uh, so it, it was just a, a nice easy push back in right right yeah yeah that's yeah that's that's totally true because i've never actually heard of somebody who's uh completely outside of the faith being converted by apologetics it's right. it's, it's it's people who are already familiar with it already kind of in the culture exactly to, to just reinforce uh, uh that yeah definitely uh the second point i wanted to make is that i i often have in the back of my mind the believers in our lives and and the skepticism that they might have for you and i uh okay. or all of the, us who have gone through deconversion on whether or not we were real christians yes <laughs> uh and so if you could address that for a minute i mean clearly just even the little bit of your story i've heard so far you were the real deal but go ahead and brag about <laughs> yourself for a second you know what was what was your the highest expression of your faith when you were in the middle of it well, let's see here. Um, so right out of high school, I decided to go to Bible college because um, I remember, you know, I had this idea that I would end up being some sort of a theological teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, let's go to Bible college. I found this 
little place up in Peterborough. <clears throat> and um, uh, I, I jumped right in with two feet. I joined the uh, evangelism team right away. So yeah. we would go, you know, handing out stuff on the streets, knocking on people's doors. I, uh, I actually got pretty good at the sketchboard. You know, where you prop up the, 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 ah, the, yeah. the paint thing on the street corner and you do this gospel presentation. Yeah. Uh, that, that was terrifying because I'm not, I'm not really wired uh, to approach and talk to strangers about really difficult uh, issues like that. So yeah, I remember the first, part, oh, the first time I went out, I, 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 started, I actually started to black out a little bit. I got dizzy and lightheaded, but I, I had to keep going because you know, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. This is the most important thing ever. Right. So I got to continue preaching the gospel. I, um, I, a, a little bit before that, I got involved with preaching. Uh, the church that I, the denomination I grew up in, the, the Plymouth Brethren. Okay. So we, we don't have pastors or anything. We have itinerant preachers instead. Okay. So, so I was one of those itinerant preachers. And I was actually pretty good at that. I was a pretty good preacher. Yeah. So I'd go around, you know, different places in Southern Ontario. Uh, the biggest thing was, though, um, after, I, after Bible college, I, I married a girl from Bible college mm -hmm. uh, who, who's from Pakistan. And actually, one of the deciding factors of marrying her was that she would open up Pakistan to me as a mission field. Oh, wow. Wow. So, so a year after we get married, a year after we got married, we have a one-month-old baby, and we're on our way. We're, at the, we're going to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And we were there for, I think, four years. And my goal, I was just trying to plant a church of Muslim background believers. You know, I had, uh, you know, what I'm, I'm trying to remember all the lingo now. You know, I had a heart, a burden for the unreached Sindhi and Marwari people group of Southeast Pakistan. And, yeah. And yeah, isn't and it like, and now you're sparking a memory for me too, isn't it? Like uh, there's a certain you know, parallel, uh, the 1040 window, there you, the 1040 window. There you go. That like, like the unchurched, uh, yes. Yeah. Unreached where, where sure. something like 90% of the world's unreached people live. And it's got like most of the population and persecution, this and yeah. unredeemed. And, uh, and I remember reading through, uh, what is that book by, uh, John Stone, uh, operation world. Ah, do you know that book? Operation I, I'm not World? sure that I that I've read that one. Yeah, it's yeah. well, it's it's actually a big reference book. It's a big fact book for mission-minded people, and it goes through every single country, mm -hmm. uh, talking about how horrible and godless they are and what needs they have. You know, so you know, I was, yeah. I was like, oh, Pakistan is so unreached. This is perfect for me. So yeah, we just wow we entered a house in a small or apartment uh, above the marketplace in a small town in Sindh. And yeah. I just, I, I went around uh, to shops trying to make friends and spreading the light of Jesus. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's about as real as it gets. Uh, it got, it got pretty real. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> but I mean, as far as, you know, clearly you were a dedicated uh, Christian, you, you know, your faith had motivated you to, uh, you know, literally move across the world and uh, yeah. And, and I mean, picked my wife out for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, that may be, I always talk about on the show, I want it to be an honesty contest. That may be one of the <laughs> most honest statements I've heard so far. So. <laughs> it's funny, actually, because we're, we're still together and we have a great relationship. And I actually remember, after, I think, uh, in our th we were married for three years. I, I wrote her a poem all about how God had tricked me into marrying her for our <laughs> own good and for his glory. <laughs> And it felt romantic at the time. I, yeah. I don't know. I should read it again sometime. That's interesting. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I relate a, a tremendous amount uh, to your story. Uh, I went to Bible college. I'm married to my college sweetheart. Uh, I wanted to be a missionary, uh, but I uh, didn't quite have the uh, motivational skills to, to get to funding, uh, uh, the funding apparatus up and running. But uh, so mm. again, I have much respect for the former you and the work that you did. <laughs> now we're going to turn a small corner and talk about uh, what were the first things that began to, uh, you know, make you lose confidence in your beliefs. I've thought about that a lot, and I think I think there's a few things coming together. One was that while I was a believer, I was very motivated to ensure that the faith I had was pure. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I was very wary 
of the sort of um, religious things that we can dilute true faith with. Uh, and part of that is the brethren upbringing because they're very much against all the kind of the religious trappings that you might see in other, uh, other denominations and, and they want to focus on the gospel in relationship with Christ. So, okay. so I was working hard at like, so actually, interestingly, the whole funding thing, I skipped that part. I didn't, I didn't raise support. Right. Um, I would write letters home and the funding came, you yeah. know, but, but, you know, one month it would be a little bit, one month it'd be a lot. So I didn't actually raise funding uh, traditionally. And then, okay, okay. So, so we spent about four years in Pakistan and mm -hmm. that was eye opening in itself. Uh, you know, for some reason, the words coming from my mouth are not spontaneously regenerating people. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so that was like a small yeah. disillusionment maybe. But when I came back to Canada, uh, I, I joined up with another missions organization here in Toronto and we lived in a, a predominantly Muslim area okay. and kind of doing the same sort of thing, just trying to very organically spread Christ. At the, at the same time, we were experimenting with different church structures, trying to get house churches going, trying to see how organic we can kind of do this faith thing. Mm -hmm. So things started to just one by one, uh, I, I started to let go of some things and, and okay. So, and the big moment for me at the time I was working nights and I had this job where I had a 10 hour shift, but only two hours of work. So I had a lot of free time and I would do a lot of Bible study during okay. this time. So I started doing just on a whim, a study of uh, hell from a biblical point of view. Okay. Right? And as I'm going through it, I start to realize hell doesn't, the, or at least the evangelical version of hell doesn't seem to be backed up by scripture, really. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Because I mean, the evangelicals will say, oh, Jesus talked more about hell than anybody else. But then you look, it's like, oh, he's talking about this place called Gehenna, which is a garbage dump south of Jerusalem, right. makes it be metaphorical. And of course, the wages of sin is death, right? Not right. torment. And people are like, well, what about the, you know, the ax is at the root of the tree and anything that doesn't bear fruit will be cast into the fire. Sure, but what happens to a tree when you cast it into a fire? It ceases to exist, right? It doesn't, it's not tormented. Right. And, you know, you know, in Revelation, you know, the lake of fire. But then it's like, but sin and death and hell are also tossed into the lake of fire. It makes it seem metaphorical. So anyway, I, I, I came home with the realization, I think I've been wrong about hell. I think the evangelical picture about hell isn't correct. And that made me think, well, what other things about my faith am I just swallowing without actually having biblical support for. So that I start getting kind of rigorous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's a door that, you know, once you open that, it's kind of hard to shut again. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I started trying to really look at the Bible through the lens of Jesus instead of, you know, through the lens of John Piper, who looks at it through the lens of John Calvin, who looks at it through the lens of Augustine and then Paul and back and back we go. And as I started doing that, pieces just started to fall away. Um, and then I remember once I just asked myself, why did I think this was real in the first place? Mm -hmm. And I thought right back to that camp experience that I had with that apologist. And the thing that had convinced me back then was not at all convincing anymore. Right. Okay. And I was just like, I, I don't see why I thought there was a God to begin with. Wow. That's quite a moment. Yeah. 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 And, and it was gradual. Like it took a couple of years and I, I you know, I kind of exited the church by way of, you know, the, the, the Brian McLaren and the emergent church was kind of like a, yeah, yeah. what do you want to say? A, a step down process for me. Cause yeah. it was, it, it, it would have been just too jarring to just kind of go from fundamentalist to right. atheist. So I had to kind of baby steps along the way. Interesting. Yeah. So the, the thing that leaps out at me uh, about your story so far is I find that it is the people who are, were the most dedicated Christians, the most concerned about truth, about understanding scripture, about conveying Christ uh, as they understood him. Mm. It is those people who, who in the search for that truth, for the, in the search for the right answers, uh, sometimes find themselves uh, finding that truth outside of the, the gospel. Yeah, yeah. Because if, if, if that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for truth, then it's, you can't choose the answers ahead of time. Right. You know, and, and something that I, that I believe is that you can't, if, 
if you're really looking for what's real, then you can't actually choose what to believe. You know, cause, cause I've had people saying, well, why don't you come back? Why don't you believe again? It's like, well, I don't have a choice. I can't actually just flip on a switch and say, okay, I have, I have decided to believe in Jesus. I don't think right. you can, I'm still too much of a Calvinist for that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The answer to the believers in our lives who ask that, it's like, well, you better pray then because God. Yeah, you better pray <laughs> because, uh, you know, faith is a gift of God. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm game if he is. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting you bring up Calvinism. Uh, you know, I feel like uh, uh, me personally, grace was a huge part of my faith. And, and uh, I, I grew up in an Arminian-leaning theology, but I had a, a professor who was a Reformed theologian who had a huge amount of influence on me. And I uh, really appreciated the idea of providence and mm. you know, God's in control. And, he, and, and I just kind of pushed away the the feelings of uncomfort you know discomfort in regards to the implications of a fully yeah. provident god you know uh, d did those subjects come up to you at all did you have to grapple with those they did and <clears throat> looking back i think i was pretty good at biting the bullet because um i mean when it came down to it if it, like if you're going to be real calvinist then you kind of have to accept very uncomfortable things like God hates a lot of people. Yeah. Like, like really. Like God, yes. when, when, it, when it says God so loved the world, that's yeah. not the world without exception. That's the world without distinction. Right. Right. So, so he loves his own. He loves Jacob. He hates Esau. Um, I remember actually once at Bible college, because we would, the denomination that I'm from is typically more Arminian leading. Uh -huh. um, but the Bible college, you know, more to the reform side of things yeah, yeah. and i remember heated discussions and i i, I made a fellow student cry once because i actually i convinced them god does hate some people <laughs> i mean that's that's what hell's for i i've had very similar conversations where your friends walk away just just shell-shocked like, with the like, oh. of what you're you know when you actually start to dig into okay we believe this thing now what does that mean <laughs> When you, yeah. feel, when you start to explore that, they can, you can get into some dark corners. Definitely, definitely. And, and I guess in a way I was kind of, I won't say comfortable with the dark implications, but so, so, so I hear people say stuff like, oh, I could never worship a God who did such and such or, or who did that. And I was always like, you don't have a choice. This is the God we have. So yeah. try to figure out a way to do it. <laughs> you know, so, so, so despite, you know, realizing that God has predestined most of humanity to eternal perdition, it was just, all right, I have to, his ways must be higher than my ways. There must be a deep, real justice to that. And I'm just such a bad person that that seems bad to me. So that's, that's on me. I'm, I must be mistaken about that which is yeah, yeah. really There's, funny to think of right now. Yeah, now it sounds, it sounds bizarre to our ears, but definitely there's a either implicit or sometimes explicit uh, push to blame yourself. If, yes. If you're having doubts, if you're, uh, you know, if you're struggling with a sin, if you, uh, you know, are not living up to the fullness of the gospel, somehow it's your fault, even though the, the Bible is chock full of, this is how God will, you know, speak through you and, and do these great works through you. And, you know, and so you find yourself, like you mentioned earlier, where, you know, just your words are not instantly converting people and mm -hmm. you're wondering, you know, what, what's wrong? It must be me. Yeah. 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 And I remember actually struggling with that a lot during Bible college because I was thinking I'm doing everything I can. I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm out on the streets, I'm, I'm knocking on doors, I'm preaching in the churches, not really seeing any fruit. So actually at one point I thought, you know what it is? It's because the first time I got baptized uh, <laughs> was before my little experimentation with atheism in high school. So I must not have been a believer then. So right. I got baptized again. Yeah, just to make sure, talk just yourself to off sure. of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Which was really cool, actually, because uh, my wife, having grown up in a Christian family in Pakistan, she was baptized as an infant. Mm -hmm. But then she comes to this evangelical Bible college and they're like, no, you have to do that as an adult. So we've both been baptized twice, which is kind of cool for me. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I do want to talk about your relationship with your wife now, but I want to save that just a little bit uh, down the line. Cool. Um, 
when the when so when things started to deteriorate as far as your faith, uh, were you did you feel guilty about your doubts? Did you feel uh, what were the emotions you were feeling as that was taking place? Hmm. I don't. So so it was such a long process, um, and before before it all kind of fell apart, I think that I was um, I was my relationship with with the faith was almost a, what do I want to say? I don't want to say a social gospel thing, but I was very um, interested and also upset with how uh, Christians tended to stand on the side of oppression instead of on the side of the oppressed, right? They, if, if, if they're going to lean one way, it's, it, it always seemed to be the wrong way, you know, siding with the rich, siding with the the dominant people groups um and so i started to uh you know on on facebook i'd be engaging with other believers who i knew personally and kind of getting into some, some of the conversations were getting pretty heated and i thought at the time i'm just trying to be more and more faithful uh but then after I, it all kind of fell away no, i don't think there was guilt there was stress but a lot of that was because of the reaction that 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 kind of so uh, I, I I came I I, I uh, announced my unbelief on my blog, and then you know the emails started coming in, and that was that was shaking for me because I was surprised by some of the hostility. You know, I would be getting emails from people who I haven't talked to for years saying stuff like. Oh, you're lost. It's a good thing that your grandparents are dead and they can't see this. Wow. Like, oh, yeah. buddy. Yeah. Uh, some of it was encouraging. You know, uh, uh, some, some people were like, oh, we're good Calvinists, so you'll be back. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. All right. Um, you definitely find out who your real friends are pretty, pretty quick, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, and so that was a very interesting. Um, experience and i think what happened the biggest thing i guess is that for the next five years or so um i felt very much alone because when you're raised in evangelicalism and you really embrace it that's your whole world that's the only people you know it's the only language you know um it's the only you know way of viewing the world and so uh shortly after uh, uh I, I i lost faith i i went to university and I just kind of very quietly went through there, not really knowing how to make relationships or keep them. Um, right. So, so I think that was the, the biggest strain. Um, and, oh, my poor wife was getting emails from people saying like, oh, look, your marriage is going to suffer now. You're unequally yoked. You're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's a self-fulfilling prophecy if I ever saw one. Yeah. 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 So I, I get well since you brought you've brought it up a couple of times, but let's let's talk about that. So you know, is is your wife currently a believer? Is she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you were to ask her, you know, are you a Christian? She'd say, yes, I'm a Christian. Um, but I think that she would be pretty quick to say, but not that kind of Christian, right? right. Um, look, it, it's funny actually. She was always just a little bit. Uh, what's the word? I was pretty hardcore for her. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, there was a couple of times where she was thinking, oh, my God, I hope this white guy doesn't get killed in Pakistan <laughs> preaching this. Because yeah. uh, I was, uh, I was, my experience of faith was different than hers. Um, she, she, she looks at, 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 at religion more as, um, how do I want to explain it? I want to say mystic, right? Mm, okay. Because yeah. she feels like she can have a relationship through disciplines like prayer. Um, that give her uh, a certain kind of power and peace that she doesn't have without it. Now, if we open the Bible and we find some horrible thing where it says, stone your children if they disobey you, or, uh, you know, LGBT people are all going to hell, she'll be like, that's, that's obviously not God, yeah, right? Yeah. So she's able to kind of separate uh, 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 the text from the actual practice of her faith in a way that I was never able to do. Uh, sometimes I wonder if I had had, if I hadn't been an evangelical, but had been like, you know, what we, what we would usually call a liberal 
Christian. Right, yes, liberal, uh, the disdain, liberal Christians. the disdain. Yeah. <laughs> but, but maybe the faith wouldn't have fallen apart because the thing about evangelicalism, it's so rigid that it's brittle. And if you break one little bit of it, the whole thing's going to fall apart, right? But for my wife, that didn't happen. You know, I, I, you know, we've had very interesting conversations about different parts of the Bible. And, you know, at the end, we would both be in agreement on our views. Uh, but her faith remains intact. Because for her, it's more experiential, I think, than whatever it was for me. Right, right. But so, but there's, there's no, is there any tension there at all? Sounds there like was. Okay. There yeah, was. There, there certainly was. And there were, there were many tearful conversations yeah. uh, in the past because, um, and also as, as my faith was deconstructing, um, people were getting concerned that I was going to fall away. And at the time, I was like, are you kidding? Leave Jesus? What are you yeah. talking about? I, can, right. I could never do that. Right. right. And I would even say, and at one point, even in, uh, uh, Ruth asked me, is, is there any chance that you're going to like deny Christ? And I'm like, no, man. Right. Right. Jesus. Right. Yeah. So then when I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm not a Christian. I don't think any of this happened. It was like, but you said, right. Yeah. So that, that, and then, and that was real, right. That was a, uh, uh, that, that was a struggle that we went through. But the thing is, We've always been good at really sitting down and talking these things through um, and listening to each other, right? I, I think that a lot of times when these conversations happen about faith, we're not listening to each other. We're talking at each other. Yeah. We're trying to get the other person to think the way I think instead of see the way I think, right? Right. right. Understand how I could come to this conclusion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so at, at our relationship today is, is great. And she understands exactly why I am where I am. And I get why she's where she is too. And neither of us really are interested in changing each other's minds because it's, it's our, our minds are, we're like-minded, even though we have different ways of looking at spirituality. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I've always, I mean, I still kind of love the trappings of, of Christianity. Uh, I, last year, I actually did a bit of an experiment where I called it the year of living Christianly. <laughs> okay. So, that, that's a twist. I like it. Tell yeah. me. About that. And it, it was, so what I did, I was like, okay, for this year, I'm going to do the, you know, traditional evangelical spiritual disciplines. I'm going to mm -hmm. read my Bible. I'm going to pray even. I'm okay. going to go to church, going to consume Christianly media. Uh -huh. You know, so I, I dusted off my Puritan paperbacks and, yeah. you know, all those things. And I just kind of did that for a year. And on one level, it was really beneficial, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that spiritual disciplines, even divorce from belief. I mean, throughout the whole year, I never even came, I, I never came close to believing in God again. Right. Like there was nothing that, that convinced me of a, an actual omnipotent being out there who wants a relationship with me but i think the act of devotional reading con contemplative exercise like prayer um it it gave me a, a nice little i don't know it scratched an itch yeah. that had been put away for a long time you know so even when the year of living christianly ended i actually still if i wake up early enough I'll crack open the Bible. I'll read it. Yeah. I'll even I even pray, right? Okay. Uh, but I understand that I'm not talking to anybody out there. Uh, one of the cool things about prayer is that it's a reinforcer of the things that you already value and want to have and want to have happen. So it's almost like you're praying to something within yourself, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that, so I that found that benefit. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, you know, just a few things I need to respond to. It's, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named uh, Ryan Bell. Uh, he mm. does the Life After God podcast. Okay, I heard of that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he was famous for doing the opposite. He was a, a Seventh Day Adventist uh, preacher, and he decided he was having he was deconstructing similar to us, and he decided to have a year without God. Wow. Uh, he blogged about that. And, you know, now he's, you know, he's a humanist. He works, uh, I believe, for the Secular Humanist, uh, Secular uh, Student Alliance uh, now. But so it's just, it's interesting that you, you, you expressed it that way. It's almost the, the exact mirror uh, opposite of, of what uh, Ryan had done. 
Uh, and then secondly, uh, you know, I think you've really touched on something really, really important. And, and that is when we decide that we no longer believe and there has to be kind of a process of walking away, of letting go. This, this is, yeah. These things, this is no longer, these no longer represent me. But we have real human needs, right? For community, yeah. for a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, a sense of peace, a sense of all of these things that the trappings, to use your word, of religion uh, provide. Yeah. Uh, so it's fascinating to hear you say that you kind of, uh, you know, intentionally went and did those things and that you still derived some value uh, from them. Yeah, from from some of them, some of them uh, were pretty negative. I because I mean, there's this evangelical church down the road, and I mean, the song time was great, and I'm just right. belting out those hymns louder than anybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then when the preacher comes on, and every sermon he's able to bring homophobia into it, and these right. anti-social justice stuff, and I'm just getting more and more stressed out as I'm sitting there for 40 minutes, and then course communion was always interesting because uh this is one of those very faithful churches where they say now remember if you're not a believer this is a cup of judgment (laughs) don't come up and so that 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 was very uncomfortable i I actually didn't go to the i didn't go to church regularly because of that i just couldn't right because it was so uh, you know i uh, so again man we're bringing up you're bringing up great things matt uh Yay. So I often attend church with my wife uh, cool. because uh, when I first came came out that I was had deconverted that I no longer believed, uh, she reminded me that that was kind of part of the contract, <laughs> and, I, and, uh, and I've always seen you know I that that it was my responsibility uh, to maintain the relationship. I'm deeply, madly in love with my wife, and so I you know it's my job to maintain that relationship to keep that relationship healthy and so it seems like a small sacrifice for me yeah i know there are other other uh uh you know atheists or agnostics who that just can't do it and i and right. I, I get that but the idea of communion is a really fascinating one i think it's i think it's an issue that deconverts have to grapple with yeah now for myself personally uh the, the church we happen to go to you know they they pass it down the aisle so i just don't take anything and I, I I hand it off but I'm often on the uh, the at the you know the outside edge of the pew and I, I wonder what are the ushers thinking <laughs> you know, like, month after month I'm, okay here you go <laughs> this, guy, this guy's not taking it what's going on so but, uh, but you've really touched on something deeply profoundly uh, fascinating that you know it really is a double-edged sword, right? It's a deeply meaningful thing for the believers. Yes. Absolutely is an us and them demarcation uh, for, for the people who might be, you know, imagine if you were an honest seeker who was not an atheist, but you just wanted to know, and you got that strong impression, you're not allowed to do this. You know, how, yes. would, how would you feel, right? Like, so anyway, <laughs> my feelings are fine. I can, I can handle that, you know, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but I'm always fascinated by the way that, uh, outsiders are treated uh, sometimes. So. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, evangelicalism kind of requires that very uh, difficult to permeate wall between yeah. themselves and the world, uh, because they otherwise they have no identity. I feel like evangelical identity is is based in in, in a large part on exclusion. It, it kind of requires that of it. Right. Right. Because because we are the bride of Christ, we are the chosen people, the holy nation, the royal priesthood, and all that. Yeah, yeah. So a couple couple more things about just you know kind of atheist in church or actually I haven't asked you what, how I shouldn't say for you how how do you identify do you do, do you consider yourself an agnostic an atheist? Uh, well, yeah, I I guess I fit the definition for atheist, but it's one of those words that yeah. is <laughs> so like. It was it was the bad word for so long. Yeah, yeah. So so it's 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 funny that way. But yeah, if somebody were to press me, so what are you? Here's a list. I'm like, yeah, I guess I'm an atheist because okay. I I don't think I don't think there's a god. It doesn't. Yeah, unless unless like um, I uh, uh uh like the unless we have a definition of God that is so broad that we should use a different word. Right. You know. 
Because like I, I remember reading on Science Mike's webpage where he says something to the effect of uh, God is at the very least the sum of all things in the universe and all the natural processes. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. well, in that case, <laughs> I definitely believe in God. In fact, yeah. technically, I am a part... I am part of the body of God. Right, right. right. And suddenly we get Christian yeah. again. I'm the body of Christ yeah. just because I'm made of molecules. You know, it's, it's interesting that you bring up uh, Science Mike. I, I have a blog post responding to that very thing. Uh, and I respect Mike a tremendous amount. So this is in no way derogatory towards him. But it's like, if God is merely the forces of nature, why should we worship that? Right. right. God is merely the 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 basis of morality why should that you know you know i have i, I just repose the same questions that that i have but uh, yeah anyway that's a total digression i don't want to go down that route quite yet but <laughs> but it's interesting you know i like i i take on the the in, even in the moniker graceful atheist you know on purpose to try to normalize it but mm. i appreciate that there are many people who uh either from what you're describing just from the distaste from their former uh you know perception of that word or the current one right like there's definitely right. you know, there's there's some backlash to the uh what you might call movement atheism or you know there's uh you know of just the hostility the very aggressive tone yeah. that's been taken and so i appreciate that you know not everyone wants to take on that that title so no worries uh and i usually try to use the term non-believer and i slipped up and started using the word so <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, to, to, to circle back, um, one of the things I find difficult at church is, is, is the singing. Uh, mm. I kind of said to myself, you know, I'll, I'll sing the songs that, that aren't say, making a, a false statement. You know, say oh, I see. True. And then I find myself being silent the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I'm being honest, I'll hum occasionally. But... <laughs> but uh, but uh, but then also I really identify with the discomfort of, uh, you know, the the when the sermon time comes, what I used to find, you know, if not inspiring, you know, uh, I I I now find you know deeply uncomfortable and and the manipulative nature of it is yeah. the only thing I can hear, and you know I appreciate that the believers in our lives will think that it's because my heart is hard, but honestly the the uh, when when you take the rose colored glasses off and you're really you're really listening right mm -hmm. you're really listening uh then it's it's hard not to hear that that it's using kind of emotional manipulation it's using um e even the kind music, of blackmail all, all of that. yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah very uh uh in interesting so yeah so you did your your year living christianly and 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 did you wrap that up or is that kind of an ongoing process for you or? So, yeah, I guess it, it officially ended, you know, December 31st of this year. I mean, originally I had this lofty idea that I would be like blogging every week and having these cool insights of an, un, of a, you know, yeah. an unbeliever walking the path again. I even, I even bought a cool logo on Fiverr. It looks very nice. Yeah. But um, when it ended, I was like, ah, a few things I kind of like and I want to keep. Yeah, and so I, I'm not nearly as faithful as I was because I'm not waking up that early anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, when I even even today, uh, uh, I'll I'll still if I wake up in time, I got you know one of those little Bible reading checklists, right? You got to go through yeah. the whole thing in a year, yeah. right? Okay. So I'm still I'm still going. I'm in I'm in First Samuel right now. There's some weird stories that I've forgotten about. <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> have a have a little prayer time, which I really do view as kind of a me aligning myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with with I guess aligning myself in such a way so that I become the person I want to be, right? Because right. right. one one idea that I still like about evangelicalism is uh, uh, modified, uh, but the idea of sanctification, mm -hmm. in that I can view my life as a journey towards becoming the a better version of me right right, right. and and i mean it's really easy to abuse that idea right it's really easy to 
take that and, and to turn it into something negative, like I'm a bad person and I need to become a good person in this weight of, uh, you know, but, but, but we, well, we can also take it in a positive way, right? That we're just kind of on a journey of becoming. So I like that idea and I kind of try to make my prayers uh, uh, align, like go in that direction, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I don't pray for things to happen in the world because I don't think that works unless there are things that I can take a, a, a hand in and, 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 and work towards. Right, that you might be able to take some action toward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, it's a, and, and I suppose I would imagine that it's a way for you to recognize the love and care that you have for the your friends and family, the people you care about. That it kind of certainly, yeah, because because it, it, it mind and focus on that. And, yeah, yeah, and I I think that's useful. I think that's really useful, uh, especially when things are really stressful. Uh, just before everybody else in the house wakes up, to remind myself that I love them and I have a role and a responsibility to play in their lives. And just to kind of, uh, what do you want to say? Gird, gird up the loins of my heart towards actually fulfilling that role the best I can. Yeah. And uh, maybe being a bit of a better match by the end of the day than at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that, uh, you know, post decon deconversion, uh, one of the things I struggle with the most is just semantics, the words. Yeah. Right? We, we need a you know a nat natural set of of terms that mean spirituality soul uh mm. you know uh uh what you're describing is prayer right but is, you know is that meditation is it you know is it what is it exactly and i, and I feel yeah. like half of our battle of of having and again for lack of a better term a a natural spirituality Mm -hmm. uh, is the language we can't absolutely we can't talk about it without um implying things that you don't mean right and just like science mike using the term god i, I feel like that uh, my, my criticism of that is that i feel like it's it's misleading yes you have yes. to read his entire book to really get what does he mean by the word god yeah and you've got to know that when you you use that word everyone else is thinking of something different now it might be different for every single individual <laughs> but a huge majority of them are thinking of a supernatural being right yes uh so but so just back to you know spiritual practices that are, could be useful because of just human needs uh you know it sounds like you're just really comfortable with using the old the old terms <laughs> you know it's 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 funny because uh I, I, when I first deconstructed, I thought, okay, how am I going to fill this sort of, I feel like I need something. So mm -hmm. I tried to turn towards like meditation mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but I was never able to get it to stick. Yeah. And I think part of that is just because of the training, right? The cultural training. I am familiar right. with things like prayer. I have formulas for that. I have in a way muscle memory even, because I can just sit down and I can go. If, if you wanted me to be in a play and play a believer and right now just go and do some random popcorn prayer, I can throw it out and just throw that out. Right. You know, because it's still there, but to sit down and meditate, that's a struggle. Yeah. Because it's unfamiliar. Interesting. Um, I, I, it's interesting because I would never talk about my spiritual disciplines without also talking about how I really view them mm -hmm. because I, I, I like, I would never just randomly tell someone that I don't know. Yeah. I, I pray because I know that they think that means I, I have a relationship with a God figure who's, who's fatherly and in charge of everything. Right. Uh, and, and likes being complimented. <laughs> yes. I, I, I love this conversation. I, I, because again, I think the, the, a large part of the audience uh, that I'm trying to build that I think will be the listeners here uh, are people who have, you know, maybe, maybe they're in the early parts of just discovering they no longer believe mm. and they're just looking around going, what do I do now? Yeah. Uh, and so I think the, you know, these are, this is a real practical example of, of someone, you know, uh, practicing spiritual disciplines in a natural way. Right. I think that's what mm. I I've hope one, so. <laughs> I've got one other question for you. If, if you had a, if, you know, extended family or your wife or someone else who asks you, you know, can we pray? How do you generally respond to that? 
Mm, like like someone who wants to pray with me. Sure. Sort of or like, you know, at a big dinner or, uh, you know, a family gathering, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, actually, um, at some family gatherings, because, okay, so in my family, I was, um, I, I, I was the preacher, right? I was the one that you would ask to say a word or to lead in prayer or to do any of that. And at some family gatherings, I find myself still being called upon yeah. in that role, even though everybody knows <laughs> I'm here. But, you know, it'd be like, you know, we'd be at like a, a wedding celebration. Okay, Matt, could you, you know, give thanks for the food? And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do that. I, I can awesome. actually do that. Yeah. And, and I mean, in the beginning, when I first started losing faith, that was actually mm -hmm. the biggest thing that kind of was difficult between me and Ruth was because she really loved praying with me. And I really felt like I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Uh, but as time went on and I started to kind of, reconfigure my brain and even how I look at things. I found a way to do it. Um, so yeah, I'll still, I'll still pray uh, uh, publicly. Mm -hmm. Probably, I, I would probably be hesitant to do it in a place where people didn't know me and know where I was coming from. I don't know why. Um, because yeah, like if I was at a church event, and someone's like, oh, Matt, it's, it's your turn to pray. I'd be like, oh, no, I, I'll, I'll pass. Right. I, I'm not actually a believer. <laughs> but with my own people who know me, uh, it's fine. It's fine. And I'm, I'm actually really fortunate in that my relationship with my family is still very good. You know, my, my, my parents um, and, and most of my relatives are still believers. They're not the kind of fundamentalist um, that we were 20 mm. years ago. Uh, right. but, but they're still believers, and we still have great relationships, great talks about things. So I'm fortunate because I, I, I hear a lot of horror stories from other people who have left the faith. Yeah. No, that, that's great. And, and again, one of my, the focus, one a focus of mine is, you know, you've, you've left religion or you've left a faith in God, but you, you have not left the people you love. And right. It actually takes some intentional work to maintain those relationships under the, the stress of, you know, as, as you are leaving. Uh, it, it, it really does. And I think looking back at the last five, cause it's been about six years now since my deconversion. And I do feel like I could have handled some social things better because I do feel like some of the relationships that were very, very important to me, I allowed them to decay in a way that I wouldn't have if I had stayed in the faith. And, and looking back, I do wish I had been a bit more intentional with, with some of my relationships. Right. Uh, uh, trying, to, trying to keep them, keep life into them, even though, because it's funny, because when you're in Bible college and church, we always say, oh, we have this great bond in Christ. Uh, and then when that bond is broken, you do feel like, oh, I guess we don't have any bond at all anymore. Right. Even though we're all humans from the exact same culture <laughs> exactly. with the exact same mythologies and stories, like nothing's <laughs> changed. It's just, I don't think the story's real anymore. Right, exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, definitely. I have, I, like, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody's asked you this question, but have you considered becoming a humanist chaplain or, because uh, it almost sounds like that's what you're doing. That'd be uh, way like, too fun. I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> Man, because yeah. I mean, a lot of times I'm like, man, I've I worked hard for a long time, and now none of my skills are marketable. Yeah, that's right. I'm not doing <laughs> anything with them. I, I do because I mean, there are spiritual skills, and absolutely. I mean, I, I really, I, you know, I don't want to push you, but I, I would highly recommend you look into it. There's, you know, lots of. I'm sure there's a Canadian Humanist Association where you could get. Yeah, there must be. I've actually that. never thought of that. It was funny because um, we, we're attending this uh, uh this this hip little uh, United Church down the road. And the, the other day I was telling Ruth, you know, if you're like a member of the United Church for like two or three years, you can apply for ordination. Yeah. <laughs> they, they let atheists be ministers there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. maybe humanist is even a better idea. <laughs> that happens to be how I, I identify, right? Like it, it, the uh, humanism, I think, it gives me an opportunity to say not just what I don't believe in, but what I do. Mm, I believe yes. in people. I believe yes. in relationships. I believe in connecting with one another. I believe in community. I believe in uh, even the rituals that we've just described, weddings and funerals and mm -hmm. gatherings, right? That there's, there's value in 
uh, having rituals with one another and, and connecting, holding hands and saying the same yep. words, you know, all of those things have uh, powerful uh, meaning for us as human beings and pretending otherwise is just not helpful. <laughs> no, 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 it, it's, it's dangerous. I mean, it, I mean we, we have to accept a few things uh, by all uh, uh, surveys and stats, people who are part of religious communities tend to do better on most measures in life, mm -hmm. right? Because there is something in there. And I think it's exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's these communities, it's these uh, communal ritual, yeah. I think, is, is, is powerful, very powerful, which is why the religions that survive have those things. They right. have those communal rituals. Right. And they've had millennia to, you know, iron out the, the details. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I, I, before, before I get onto a different topic, I just want to ask, was there a person or a particular, you know, book or resource that, that helped you either begin the process or through the process of deconversion? Was there something that yeah, there would have actually been a couple. Um, right at the very, very, very beginning. Um, uh, so before, before, um, before uh, I, 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 I'm trying to figure out what to say. Uh, so yeah, I read a bunch of uh, Brian McLaren's books when I was still a believer, yeah. right? I was still a preacher and still believed in the resurrection, which like you said, I think is the, that's the crux yes. of Christianity, I think, <laughs> crux. Um, <laughs> yes, pun intended. <laughs> uh, uh, and I and I found I resonated very strongly with that for a while, um, but you know, and then I just kept going. So another book that was important. Oh, so a new kind of Christian uh, uh, was the one. Uh, okay. And then here's a weird one: uh, "The Kingdom of God Is Within You" by Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy. Mm, yeah. So it's a nonfiction book where yeah. he unpacks his ideas of Christian anarchism. Okay. which which still uh, resonates very strong with me because he was an atheist mm -hmm. and a Christian. He was a secular Christian. He didn't believe in God. Right. He didn't believe in the resurrection, but he thought that the path of Christ is the only way to true, you know, heaven on earth. And it includes strict pacifism and anarchism. Interesting. And, yeah. and for some reason, that, 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 that one was big for me. Um, and there was a paper written by Clark Pinnock uh, that had to do with how hell doesn't exist, which I guess started everything. Okay. Huh. All right. Yeah, but uh, yeah, nothing else really jumps out at me. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you. I was a big Dostoevsky guy, so like the mm. Brothers Karamazov and you know that that Grand Inquisitor section of that, uh, and just Ivan, who's the atheist in the story really, you know, started to haunt me over time. So it's interesting, interesting. Uh, Tolstoy. I might have to, might have to read that. So <laughs> Yeah, that was a good one. I, I have that uh, Dostoevsky on my shelf. My brother keeps telling me to read it. I'm yeah. going to have to. Yeah. So uh, I asked you before we started, if you'd be willing to do a few uh, devil's advocate uh, questions. You, you've answered a lot of these, but I'm going to just, we'll just, we'll <laughs> just uh, roll through these really quick, quickly. Uh, is it that you just want to be able to go and sin? Oh, yeah, because that's because that's way too fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. It's 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 it, that's always a funny question too, because I mean it so after leaving the faith, yeah, I did. I started drinking more, you know? Mm, okay. I, I experimented with drunkenness yeah. and you know, uh but my lifestyle is not significantly different than how it was because when it comes to sin i mean if we you know because I, I do like taking christian words and kind of atheizing them for yes, my own yeah, yeah. Yeah. so i still kind of have a concept of sin which to me is just anything that pushes against human flourishing anything that is destructive to me or the people around me so mm -hmm. no i don't sin more i don't I don't go around murdering and raping and just being <laughs> nasty to people uh, uh, because that's, and that was never, that was never the, the, the motivator. That was never, motiv I love that rigorous, strict, almost ascetic lifestyle. There's comfort there. Yeah, yeah. It's scary to be a hedonist. I, I think I was, I was the most surprised about how little changed. 
and mor yeah. morality wise, right? Like they, yeah. you know, I was able to fully embrace the LGBTQ community, uh, you know, people that were different than myself without any hesitation in a way that I felt uncomfortable with prior to that. Yeah. Uh, but, but other than that, you know, very, very little changed. I still love people. And that's, that was the driver for me yeah. uh, for going into ministry, going to Bible college. And it, you know, it's the driver for me now doing this podcast is about reaching people, connecting with people, you know, so it's still about grace. It's, it's, still, it's still about grace. I, I, so I talk about secular grace, secular grace. Yeah. Just like you, I'm trying to redeem these, these churchy words. <laughs> well, we can't get away from it. Yeah, we can't. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what, uh, I'm just segue here for just a quick second, but I think one of the greatest criticisms of humanism is that it cargo cults, it brings in bits of Christianity uh, hmm. into humanism. And I go, yeah. It does. <laughs> we do that. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, the parts that are good, that are functional, that are, are, you know, are that, like you say, promote human flourishing, we should use those things. And, yeah. and unabashedly so. So anyway, yeah. uh, more devil's advocate questions. Uh, is it that you just got mad at God? Were you just angry? Oh, I love that question. You're mad at God. It's really hard to be mad at a fictional character. Um, yes. And, 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 I, I, I've found that to be the question that I can resonate with the least. I don't even really know. I think you have to be a believer to be mad at God. Yeah. Right. And my view of God was so scary, you know, because I, I, I was the seven point Calvinist yeah. uh, uh, guy where, where God is reprobating untold billions. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't. Actually, I guess back in those days, there were times where I'd be like, why is it like this? But no, there's no, there's no anger towards that at all. In fact, I still look at the God figure, the idea of a God, mm -hmm. with some tenderness. Mm. You know? And, and I, it's interesting, actually. I, I wrote a poem about that a couple of weeks ago, how whether it's true or not, um, I think Christianity is where I first learned how to love. Right. Right. Um, so I'll always kind of look fondly at that good part of it. Uh, right. So no, I'm not mad at God. <laughs> he might be mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think uh, we, we've touched on this subject a couple of times, but there's there's a sense in which we are now, uh, you know, Christian atheists or Christian agnostics or, or <laughs> Christian non-believers. Right. Yes. You're, you're describing Tolstoy as being you know, culturally Christian, uh, but, but atheistic. And, and I think that's definitely a real thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. we, we cannot escape our culture. And, and uh, I think if we, if we think we can, we are fooling ourselves again. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so yeah, I think that, I, I think that's definitely true. Um, is it possible you just had the wrong image of God? Was he too scary, too provident, too you know, what if you'd have been more Arminian? What if you'd have the Catholic God? What if, uh, what if you had uh, Dostoevsky's uh, uh, Russian uh, Orthodox? <laughs> <laughs> definitely read that book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got, oh, I've gotten that question too. You should be a Catholic then, or you should be. Yeah. I remember I, I had the opportunity to interview Derek Webb uh, for my YouTube channel, and most of the comments were like, "You guys don't understand because you were Calvinists. That's yeah. what screwed you over." <laughs> and and my answer to that is. No, because I also toyed with the other Christian versions of God too. I was not born a Calvinist. Right. right? I, was, I was convinced, you know, through scripture that Calvinism was true. But even when I started to deconstruct, I stopped off at many of the different understandings of God and even different understandings of scripture. Mm -hmm. But none of them could answer this, the, the main question of why do we think that there is a being, a person, or at least a person-like thing behind all this. Mm -hmm. Why do we think that they're good? And why do we think that Jesus is his son who rose from the dead? And also these books, which seem very uh, disparate and uh, what do you want to say? Don't fit together well. Mm -hmm. Why do we think that's holy? Because none of the uh, views of God answer that question. Right, right. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting you mentioned, you know, 
you know, people say, well, it's because you were a Calvinist. And then, and then if you weren't a Calvinist, it would be because you're not a Calvinist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever the believer is that's looking at, at you as a non-believer, you know, they're going to, uh, they're going to say, oh, well, you know, you weren't a, a good enough evangelical or you weren't, yeah. you weren't my brand, my specific targeted version of Christianity. And therefore everything you say is invalid. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so again, we've touched on this just a smidge, but wh why not be a liberal believer? Uh, you know, why throw the baby out with the bathwater? Right. Which, which, uh, uh, incidentally, I don't think I am doing cause I, I, like we said, I like the trappings. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the baby, I think. Yeah. 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 The rituals. Uh, but why not be a liberal Christian? And you know what, even in, in the past year, that thought's come to me a couple of times, mm -hmm. but the answer always comes down to the crux. Mm -hmm. Did Jesus, did Jesus Christ raise from the dead? Right. right, right. Or, or uh, uh, is there an, om an omnipotent God in some way unfolding this huge history, uh, the story of humanity and his grace and his glory? If, if, if I can't answer yes to that, then I don't know. I, I, I don't know how you could do a Christianity without that. Right. I, I, think, I think it's something else. It's, it's, it's Christianly, yeah. but it's not Christianity. It's, it's yeah. like a flavor rather than the substance. It's like pistachio ice cream. It's not a pistachio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it is good. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, last devil's advocate question. Uh, how, how can you be moral without uh, an absolute objective standard to judge yourself by? And, and the answer to that is I can't help it because when we're talking about morality, nobody consults some objective moral standard that they have tattooed to the back of their head or something like that. Morality is, is, is something that I think we have in us. It, it, it's certainly taught, right? It's certainly taught but it's also natural. It's kind of like speech, right? Like you have to learn how to speak, but we're also wired for it. We're ready for it. So morality will come no matter what. The, the thing is though, that without God, I get to be a part of creating that morality rather than having it dictated to me, which is nice because then it can change. And, and like you said, one of the nicest things about losing faith was that I could fully uh, embrace the LGBT community, yeah. right? I, I, I could just, without hesitation, it was like there was no more baggage there. Right. So I think that my morality got better as a result of leaving the faith because Absolutely. if you have an absolute standard of morality, I think that's, I think that's a bit weird. Because there's nothing absolute that we have ever encountered in our little human lives. Nothing is ever absolute. So why would our moral codes also be absolute? They're always in flux and they're always changing. And I think uh, if, if, if we take the whole scope of history together, I think they're refining towards something that's nicer than what it was, you know, when we were, you know, scratching around 2000 years ago. Right, right. It progresses. Yeah. It progresses for sure. And I guess that's, that's one of the main things of humanism, which is so nice about humanism. It's, it's got that forward looking thing. I had this, I had this idea in the last year where it would be cool to like kind of create a new, a new kind of religion where instead of looking at our old gods and the gods of our fathers, we started looking towards the future and finding new gods and like, like kind of framing it like, could I live in such a way so that my grandchildren could morally approve of my life? You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I like, I like that idea. We were looking forward uh, uh, rather than backwards. Mm, very good. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I, I'm cognizant of our time. I think just a, if I could have just a few more minutes, minutes, uh, I, I wanted to ask specifically about, so you were a missionary to uh, Pakistan. Do you find that that as a non-believer now that you reach out to uh, the Muslim community? I it's interesting because um, I I do I do have this. What do I want to say? I feel a connection with the Muslim community, and it's probably because of the 
nasty colonial stuff that I did. So the, the source of it isn't good. I mean, oh my God, I was thinking about this recently, actually, because um, shortly after uh, I was in Bible college uh, when 9-11 happened. And then a few months later, me and my friends, we started going into mosques uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, try to start conversations, leave gospel tracts in conspicuous places. Uh, and I did end up developing, you know, real friendships with members of the Muslim community, especially in Pakistan. I got invited to, uh, you know, little Sufi prayer meetings, which are really cool. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and 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 every, every to this day, every time I pass a mosque, I, I got this urge to kind of go in and talk to people, but without the baggage of mm -hmm. trying to convert people to my way of thinking. More like I want to... Uh, uh, not not to say I want to join your community, but I want our communities to touch, right. and, and 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 I want I want there to be real fellowship uh, between us. But as an atheist, I have no idea how to do that. So, uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, you are a humanist chaplain just trying to get out. <laughs> what a fun idea! That I think was. I really I, I, in a year from now you're going to be back on telling me about all those experiences. <laughs> awesome! I'll have a caller and everything. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> For the people who are listening, who are either at the beginning, uh, they're just starting to have doubts, maybe they're still a believer, or they're just on the other side, they've just admitted that they no longer believe, what advice would you give them? What would you, what would you mm, do? That's interesting. I would, um, I'd say, I would say be mindful of how you feel as, as you go through this, and, and That's tricky. Be be willing, be willing to keep bridges where you can, but also be willing to walk away from them because you don't owe your community. Um, you don't owe your community to stay if it's not yours anymore. Yeah. You know? Um, uh, and 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 also it can it's gonna be probably hard and yeah. and be prepared for that. But it's okay that it's hard because and also, and actually, this is a big one, I think, because some people that I've talked to who've left the faith have talked about the feeling of waste uh, of, of the years and the effort that they put into it. I'd want to encourage them and say, it wasn't a waste. Mm -hmm. every, every spiritual hardship that you went through, all your trying, all your suffering, they did something to you to help make you who you are now. And even if a lot of that was traumatic, uh, and you still have to deal with the repercussions. It is still you, and 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 you don't need to feel bad about that time. You can still own that and say, I I've been through this, and I've learned from this, and I can go forward. I love that. That's fantastic, <laughs> Matt. I've really appreciated this conversation. Uh, I thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank I, you. I've had a great time. I just want to say, you know, you the. I talk about a lot that I want this to be an honesty contest and you have, you have won the honesty contest. This is exactly the kind of thing that I, that I, that I want to expose the listeners to again. Thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Loved it. All right. Until next time. All right. Talk to you. Some final thoughts on the episode. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Matt Cook as much as I did. He was a fascinating person to talk to, uh, kind of the complete opposite of what we typically hear from some of the secular community. Uh, he's unabashedly religious. I found it fascinating that he is still the spiritual, for lack of a better term, leader of his family, that everyone still looks to him for guidance. And this brings up the topic of humanist chaplaincies or officiants or celebrants. I jokingly tell Matt that I think he is a, a, a humanist chaplain in disguise, uh, and I hope he looks into that. But the point is that just because we no longer believe in God does not mean that we don't need to have ritual together, community, organization. We need to celebrate things like weddings and births and deaths, and we need a way to do that in an official way. And that is where the idea of an official humanist chaplaincy or efficient or celebrant comes in. If you're interested in looking into becoming a humanist chaplain, I will have links in the show notes to several humanist organizations that you can look into. 
the major religions have had millennia to work out the various rituals and practices that bring people together and form a community. As humanists, that should be our, our goals, to bring people together and to provide meaning and purpose for everyone's lives. I want to thank Matt for coming on the show and sharing his story, as well as his unique perspective and his infectious joy. As always, if you want to tell your story about faith transitions, please get in touch with me at gracefulatheist at gmail.com or at gracefulatheist on Twitter. Time for some footnotes. The song is a track called Waves by Micaiah Beats. Please check out her music. Links will be in the show notes. If you'd like to help support the podcast, here are the ways you can go about that. First, help promote it. The podcast audience grows by word of mouth. If you found it useful or just entertaining, please pass it on to your friends and family. Post about it on social media so that others can find it. Please rate and review the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This will help raise the visibility of our show. Join me on the podcast. Tell your story. Have you gone through a faith transition? You want to tell that to the world? Let me know and let's have you on. Do you know someone who needs to tell their story? Let them know. Do you have criticisms about atheism or humanism, but you're willing to have an honesty contest with me? Come on the show. If you have a book or a blog that you want to promote, I'd like to hear from you. Also, you can contribute technical support. If you are good at graphic design, sound engineering, or marketing, please let me know and I'll let you know how you can participate. And finally, financial support. There will be a link on the show notes to allow contributions which would help defray the cost of producing the show. If you want to get in touch with me, you can Google Graceful Atheist, or you can send email to gracefulatheist at gmail.com. You can tweet at me at Graceful Atheist, or you can just check out my website at gracefulatheist.wordpress.com. Get in touch and let me know if you appreciate the podcast. Well, this has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Grab somebody you love and tell them how much they mean to you. This has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast.